everyone. My name is Laura Dinardis, the Interim Dean of the School of Communication at American University, and it's a pleasure to welcome you to this special Changemakers conversation featuring media changemaker Allison Camerata, award-winning journalist, author, and anchor of CNN's morning show, New Day. She's a recipient of an Edward R. Murrow Award and two Emmy Award nominations for her breaking news reporting. Whether reporting from ground zero after 9-11 terrorist attacks or from the hot zone of New York City more recently during the COVID-19 pandemic or the tragic aftermath of events such as the Parkland, Florida school shooting, she has been on the forefront of the most pressing events of our time. As a leading voice of the hashtag MeToo movement, Allison helped to provide hashtag silence breakers with a platform to tell their stories. And she has anchored a number of primetime specials, including Tipping Point, Sexual Harassment in America, and The Hunting Ground, Sexual Assault on Campus. Her debut novel, Amanda Wakes Up, was selected by NPR as one of the best books of the year and by Oprah Magazine as a must read. And she's currently working on a memoir, which I can't wait to hear about. I think that's really great. And something I'm most especially um, interested in and proud about. Um, Allison attended American University on a presidential scholarship, graduating cum laude in broadcast journalism. Allison, welcome and thank you so much for taking the time to join us today. Dean, it's so great to see you. Thank you for having me. I can't believe we're on this platform, this video platform. It seems like years ago when we were just sitting and having lunch and could actually be co-located, but thank you for um, accommodating this and you know obviously the reason that we're having a video discussion is because we're still in the middle of a once a century pandemic. I wanted to start by asking you how your life as a journalist has changed during the pandemic and I, I assume but I'm not sure are you reporting from home do you still have a crew I mean how has that experience been for you as a morning anchor? Um, it has been mind-blowing it is different than anything that I have ever done in my career. I have a studio in my home. I have lots of equipment sitting in my basement, but it is mostly gathering dust because I, I was only able to broadcast there from about, for about a week, um, from March you know, 6th till now. I've been going into the city every day and basically the equipment is great. I mean, it is, you know, world-class high-end equipment, top shelf, but there's still a second delay from my home studio between my co-anchor and me. And so because we're a dual anchor show, it's just that little bit of a micro pause that makes the rapport and the chemistry a little clunkier it makes everything a little bit like I sometimes step on him. If I have a guest, it feels like there's a pause and you don't know if, if somebody's going to start speaking. And so it, it may not even be perceptible to the you know naked eye or the, the typical viewer, but it was just enough to make sort of my bosses feel like it wasn't totally up to snuff. And I mean, that just leads me to how much the viewers have had to tolerate during this time with all of our home studios, all of our jerry-rigged setups, all of our, I haven't had a hair and makeup person for four months. I'm doing this whole thing myself. So please, yes, cry me a river. It has not been easy to put these fake eyelashes on every day. Um, and so, you know, I mean, I just, I crack up with what the standard is now that we watch on TV. It's like nobody's hair looks good. You see everybody's home. And at least on my show, uh, almost once a day, something crazy happens where like a guest's audio drops out. We can't get their, you know, Skype to work. They like pixelate into complete like a kaleidoscope of color and then just like drop out. And you know, somehow the viewers don't mind. I mean, we still are having this record number of viewership right now and everybody, I guess, just accepts that we're in this very strange time and our tech, you know, our technology and our broadcast is not going to be seamless. There's a whole genre of YouTube videos now. Uh, people are really into when like a weather anchor's dog jumps into the screen of you or a toddler roams into it. I mean, it's, I think people are, are understanding and, and kind of into it. 
but uh, yes, and I mean that stuff is great. I mean there is look there there we were getting already we were there was a trend of peeling back the curtain, you know, with social media letting people inside, letting people see the more authentic you. Um, and you know, we have gotten that in spades. I mean, I love those, those toddler videos of them, you know, breaking in as there's some very scholarly expert, you know, opining on world politics. And then like the toddler comes in is just, it's great. It's fantastic. And then, you know, there's also that uh, rating system. I don't know if it's on YouTube or just Twitter of like rating people's bookshelves. Yours gets a 10 by the way, Dean. I mean, your bookshelves are two completely very high, high quality. Um, that means a lot coming from you. Thank you. Don't look too closely. Right. Uh, well, the, um, you know, I, on, on the serious subject of it, so you've been covering the pandemic, you've been covering many serious topics. Um, the journalism students are watching closely to see how this is playing out. They're affected personally, but you have a whole history of covering really difficult events. I'm thinking in particular about your interviews with the Parkland students. I, I think immediately after the massacre, interviewing people, you know, right after the 9-11 terrorist attacks. I was wondering if you could share a little bit about what have been your most challenging moments in reporting and advice for how do students hold it together? I mean, how do you hold it together when you're dealing with something challenging like that? Well, practice. I mean, I've gotten, unfortunately, used to tragedy. I mean, that's by definition what news often covers. And so with the Parkland students, um, I was there so early on the ground. I mean, they hadn't processed yet what had happened to them. I arrived you know, I was on the air the, the next morning in front of the high school at 5 a.m. And so it had just happened that afternoon or morning. I can't remember the exact time, but, but the kids were still coming back to the crime scene. They were still trying to just, it, it was surreal for them. And so what I, what I find, and I mean, my tip is just like, get out of the way. You know, I just get out of the way. Like at times like that, I can just pose the questions and I can... Uh, empathize as best as I can and try to be a compassionate voice. But for the most part, I just see myself as a conduit for whatever they want to say. And what I found, at least with Parkland, is that they were ready to say a lot. They already, those kids were really remarkably different because they were already in action. By the time I showed up, I mean, it hadn't been 24 hours. I don't even know that it had, well, yeah, I guess it had been more than 12 hours, but they were already in action mode of what they wanted to see change how they were gonna be the change, what they were demanding from adults, what they were demanding from our elected officials. And that was so remarkable to me because I've sadly covered so many of these school shootings. The fact that they were already in action mode, I knew that that was a story. And so I just tried to let them talk. I just tried to be the conduit. When I could be a compassionate voice, I was able to. But I also think that, you know, times have changed. And, and I don't think that the audience needs us to just be automatons and emotionless and just to be the sort of old school anchor where we don't emote and we don't ever let the audience see us, you know, laugh or cry or get emotional or get angry. Like, the, you know, cable news has come a long way from that. So when I would get choked up or if I wanted to, you know, hug a crying student, I just didn't stop myself. You know, I, I thought that, that that was fine. Um, and I mean, I would say that the hardest story that I, that I can remember ever doing was, you know, for five years, I was a crime reporter at America's Most Wanted. It was a great job. It was in Washington, DC. I had only graduated two and a half years earlier from American and the idea that I was already gonna be on TV and be going into prisons and into jail cells and asking, you know, fugitives that we'd caught, like, why did you do it? What do you have to say to the victims? It was very, very thrilling to me. I, I, I minored in criminal justice, so I've always liked crime. Uh, so anyway, it was a thrilling job. However, um, it was very hard. I mean, there were very, very, very raw emotions. Um, and the story that will never leave me is the story of a missing child. It was in Indiana. His name was Zack Snyder. And um, we were looking for him. We were looking for where this missing child was. 
and we were interviewing his parents and we were going around and interviewing the cops and we happened to be at his parents and we had a microphone on his mom and at that exact moment I looked out the window and I could see kind of an armada of police cars pulling up in front of her house and I thought oh this is interesting I wonder if they have some sort of information and at that moment I saw the chaplain the car the, the chaplain pull up and he got out in his collar and I said oh oh no, like he just unfolded in front of our eyes that they had found him and he'd been murdered by a neighbor. And being there at that moment for such raw emotion, having the mom, Mike, we couldn't like, we were already, we couldn't get out. We couldn't get out of the situation. You know, the police wanted us out, but all of our equipment was still in the house. So we had to hear everything that was happening. And I just thought, you know, I'll never recover from this. I'll just never recover from this kind of grief. But of course I did. Um, and I just realized, I mean, the thing that I hang on to and the things that I would tell students is that even grieving parents often want to tell their stories. You know, if they don't, I never press them to. But what I've found even during coronavirus now and during crime coverage and during any tragedy, often people who are suffering do want to tell their story. They don't want their loved one to have died in vain. And so that has carried me that I never, I never feel like I'm forcing them or tricking them to talk. They, they want to talk and get their story out. Now on this subject of, of talking and speech and, and, and openness, um, I want to ask you a little bit about uh, the state of the First Amendment because you've been a very strong proponent of First Amendment rights, you know, as many of us in the communication industries are, you know, not only in your own work, but as um, a National Advisory Council member for the News Literacy Project and I believe an advisory member of Press Forward. You've done a lot of work on this. And around the world, there are exacto knife technical tools for censoring in all kinds of environments. I mean, the, like freedom of uh, the press and freedom of speech is very challenged around the world uh, with these efficient forms of censorship. And here in the United States, um, our president has spent years now calling mainstream news outlets fake news and um, you know attacking the press in various ways. And now there's a debate. Um, I guess there always has been raging about the state of a free and open, basically a, a debate about free and open debate, especially in the news, uh, in the written print journalism, but, but everywhere. Could you just, should we be worried? Like what is the state of free speech in America? Well, uh, we definitely have free speech in America. We definitely are in a different category than so many other countries, as you point out internationally, where journalists are all the time jailed where they're killed. I mean, it is very dangerous in some countries, in authoritative, authoritarian countries, to be a journalist. Um, the Committee to Protect Journalists, if people want to go to the website, you can see just how many journalists lose their lives every year. How many journalists are jailed? This is the Philippines. This is Bulgaria. This is Russia. This is North Korea, of course. I mean, just on and on and on. There's a litany of places where it's really dangerous. Here in the United States, it's um, demoralizing. You know, it's, de it, it's uh, disheartening what's happening. It, it, the Trump administration has definitely tried to make journalists enemy of the people. I mean, I'm just using their own language. Um, and it can't help but have the effect of making people question and doubt the information that they're getting. You know, I think that President Trump has been effective in trying to cast journalists as somehow adversaries. And, you know, I mean, I just learned at American University, we're supposed to be watchdogs of government. We're not lapdogs of government. We're watchdogs. I mean, that was one of the first things I learned in my first mass media 101 class. That's our job. And, you know, I mean, I've, I've had conversations with President Trump about this, that he doesn't actually grasp that. He wants good coverage. He wants glowing coverage. He wants positive coverage. I've had to explain that's not the mission statement of journalists. The mission statement is to be watchdogs of government and to point out where we see hypocrisy, to point out where we see um, misleading statements. If there's something that needs to be fact-checked, and there is every single day, that's our job. That's what we're tasked with doing. It has nothing to do with you, don't take it personally. But he, of course, didn't see it that way. Um, and so it is, uh, this is a hard time. 
I mean, it is definitely a hard time. It's, it's hard when you go into a crowd, as some of my colleagues do, at you know, a Trump rally or just out in the world, and they're shouted down and they're called names. I was recently at a beach. I was wearing a, a CNN t-shirt that said, um, journalism matters. I mean, it was something so innocuous. It said something like, good journalists are important. And a guy, you know, sauntered up to me and said, <laughs> you know, I think the world could use a few less journalists. Like, that's just what people now feel. And so then I got into it with him and we parted as friends because I felt that I schooled him on why it was so important. And perhaps he would like to go live in Russia if he feels that way. Um, but, you know, that's what we now have to encounter. And there's good news and bad news. Look, the bad news is that local news is really struggling right now. Newspapers, local newspapers are evap evaporating and they are the heart and soul, as you know, of any local community. I mean, they are the ones that go to the city council meetings and tell the locals what's happening in their, in their local government. And COVID hasn't helped with all of the belt tightening and all of the economic stress that's put on newsrooms. Um, that's the bad news. The good news is that the hunger for information and for news is still really high. The New York Times subscriptions are way up. CNN's ratings are way up. Across cable news, they're seeing ratings up. So the, the desire for information is still really there from the audience and from readers and viewers, but um, it is definitely a challenging time to be, you know, to be called names and have our reputations um, attempted to be tarnished. Reminding people of the importance of real journalism, real journalism. I think that was part of your motivation for writing your book, Amanda Wakes Up, which as I, I think you told me that was loosely based on your experience working in broadcast journalism. But could you, you know, for the student viewers of this, could you just tell them what does real journalism look like to you in the modern era? Well, real journalism is fact-based. I mean, that's just the, you know, let's just start there. You have to be fact-based. You have to have done your research. We have a rule that you always have to have at least two sources. Your sources have to be rock solid. You have to have vetted them. You can't just, you know, go to air with a rumor or gossip or your hunch about something. That's not journalism. Now that's happening a lot right now. And you're right, I did write Amanda Wakes Up because I was so frustrated by what I was seeing. I don't like all of these kind of half-baked websites that crop up that appear to be news sites. They're not. They're opinion websites. They're people with some sort of often conspiracy theory and they're just venting their spleen or they're making up conspiracies. And because it's in the same font maybe that real news sites use or maybe the graphics look very professional, I don't blame people for being confused. There's such a tsunami of information coming at us right now. There's such a proliferation of information sites that of course people don't know where to turn. So that is very frustrating to me. And then at the time that I wrote it, I was working at Fox. I was uh, one of the hosts of their morning show, Fox and Friends, which is not a news show, not a news show. But the people who watch it don't know that. They don't advertise the fact that they're not a news show, but they don't follow the same rules as a news show. I mean, what I do now, on CNN is night and day different than Fox and Friends. Fox and Friends, what, what they would do was get some sort of cockamamie uh, headline from some unvetted website or source, and we would turn it into a segment. That's not news. That's called talk radio, you know, on TV. That's so they, they weren't using the rules of journalism. They weren't even trying to use the rules of journalism, but again, that's kind of hidden. And so when people think, when they watch Sean Hannity or when they you know, watch Tucker Carlson, they're watching a news show. I just was getting frustrated that obviously people don't know the rules of news and of journalism and they don't know how to distinguish those very, very blurred lines. And so I just ch came home and I would like channel all of my frustration into my notes and my writing. 
And I made it satirical because a lot of it is satirical. I mean, a lot of what goes on behind the scenes at any newsroom during the commercial break, I have always found hilarious. That has not changed. There are still all sorts of jokes and often crude jokes and often, you know, gallows humor that takes place in newsrooms. That still happens. Um, but I think that the overarching message is that this is deadly serious stuff. And, you know, the consumer has to um, be aware of what they're getting and has to educate themselves, which is why I'm involved with News Literacy Project, which is such a great project. You know, everybody can go to newsliteracy.org to find out more about it, but basically they go into schools and help educate teachers as well as students for how to spot real news. The real ingredients that you should look for in every news story and how to know if something's been photoshopped and how to know if it's a conspiracy theory that doesn't smell quite right. And that kind of news literacy is just more important now, I would say, than ever, because you really don't know which information source you can trust, as we've learned so painfully with Facebook, um, where you know people are getting a lot of their news and information right now, and not all of it is vetted, and conspiracy theories are running amok. So, you know, my advice to people, uh, I mean, to students, it is that you must be fact-based. And if you are fact-based, you'll never go wrong. I mean, you won't get in trouble and your viewers will get the best information. But to consumers, I just say go with a tried and true uh, news source that has a long track record of winning awards and of having been around a long time and having journalists that you trust. That's just... We're, we are following much, much different rules than some sort of link that your friend sends you from sort of some crazy website. That's just, they are not, that's not news. And a lot of uh, Twitter postings don't come from people at all. They're actually bots or yes. they could come from Russian troll farms, right? So that, yeah, thank you for raising the issue of trust. Have you been taking notes all along during your career uh, for your memoir or is this something that you, decided recently to do, what was the impetus for uh, starting to write a memoir at this point? You know, this is a book that I've been, that has been following me around for a decade, and it's not about my career. It's about my teenagehood. It's about all of the sort of ingredients that led me to where I am today. It's about, you know, I had um, a sort of unusual, I guess, um, teenagehood in that I was fiercely independent. I ended up leaving home when I was 16 years old. I always worked. I, I had to often support myself. I ended up getting a scholarship to AU. I knew really early at 15 that I wanted to be a broadcast journalist. I then like set my sights on that in a sort of singular focus. And so it's about, um, you know, all of the things that led me to where I am now and that kind of grit and determination and hard times, you know, it is hard, I think, to be a teenager and it is hard to um, be a teenager sometimes, you know, on your own and fiercely independent. Um, and so that's the story that I've always wanted to tell. And just yesterday, I literally opened Pandora's box. I found a tin. It's like one of these popcorn tins, a big, huge barrel, you know, that popcorn at Christmas comes in. And I opened it and it was thousands of letters from friends. It was some love letters from boyfriends. It was my AU grades, like my report cards when grades came out. It was like notes from professors. It was everything of that time of that time period. I mean, it was from basically my senior year through AU. And I fell so far down the rabbit hole yesterday, like for three hours. I was just, I like just looked in to see like, oh, I wonder if this is gonna be interesting. My husband came in like <laughs> three hours later and I, I like my tear streaked face. I like looked up at him. He was like, what are you doing? I was like, I can't even describe it. And so I'm so happy. I mean, this is like, you know, these are kind of, historical documents. I mean, this is first source material, um, but it's painful uh, and also revealing to revisit, you know, who I was at 18 and 19 and 20 and 21 years old. And it's just, it's intense. So anyway, more material for the memoir that I continue to plod through. 
Absolutely. Maybe we'll give out uh, popcorn tins to students this, uh, in the fall semester so they can start collecting. Um, and, you know, just as of just um, before we run out of time, I want to just ask you, I mean, you've been so uh, generous with the students and, you know, mentorship and example. And thank you for the virtu your virtual commencement um, note to them. You know, we had to have we're doing things. Um, we're coming back in the fall partially. Um, we, but we had a virtual commencement, as you know, hopefully we'll have an in-person commencement, but thank you for your, you know, remarks to the students. Do you have any um, final thoughts, um, advice that you would give to aspiring journalists in this um, health, political, and economic climate? Yes, um, it's a great job. It is a great job. I have never, it is a hard job. It is a taxing job. I wake up at 3 a.m. every day. I'm often exhausted. And believe me, this is nothing new. I mean, throughout my whole career, I would sometimes work 12 hours, 18 hours. I mean, it just depends on what the story is. Sometimes you're chasing a story and you don't have time to sleep. When I started out in this business, I didn't make any money. I was broke, you know, I had to, I mean, in Amanda Wakes Up, I tell the story of, how she eats a hot pretzel and she has to like ration it throughout the day. That's a real story. You know, I went out and bought a hot pretzel and like one arm was for breakfast, one arm was for lunch, the like twist was for dinner. And so, um, and mustard is a vegetable. Um, and so despite, so ketchup. yes, it is according to the government. Um, despite all of that, I've never regretted a day of it. I mean, it is a wonderful career. You know, you, you are imbued with the power to ask powerful people real questions and to speak truth to power and to try to get information. And that is a really privileged position. And it's exciting and every day is different and it's important. You know, I feel particularly now during coronavirus, the import of my job every morning, of every morning coming on and telling people where we are as a country, what the status is, how many, uh, states are seeing cases spike. Where is it? Where are they doing it right? You know, all of that stuff. It's really important. And so if you have journalism in your veins and you have to, I think, in order to make some of the sacrifices that it requires, it's still a wonderful job. And the upside of the proliferation of all of these different outlets is that I think you have more options than, you know, back when I gra graduated, there were three news networks broadcast news networks and one cable news outlet called CNN. And, you know, jobs were scarce then too. The 80s, there was a recession. I graduated into a recession. But if you love it, you just never give up. I mean, I just felt like I will work somewhere. And I don't know if that's Peoria or if that's Yakima, Washington, or if that's America's most wanted, but I'm going to find a job somewhere and so will you as students i mean so will they that there will always be a job and the fact that there's different outlets only helps that the fact that you can now be a digital reporter the fact that there is no one main route anymore to reporting success um just right you know even in the course even in the middle of a pandemic even when you have to be socially distant you can still write you can write stories you can still work the phones you can still write essays and so um, you know, you know, if you have that drive for this career, and I'm just telling you, it is worth it. It is still a wonderful, wonderful profession. Being a journalist is just a great, you know, it's a privilege. It's worth it. It's a good message for students. Well, Allison, uh, congratulations on all of your success so far. I can't wait to read your memoir, but Allison Camerata joining us today for the Media Changemakers Conversation. Um, award-winning journalist, author, CNN anchor. Thank you so much, Allison, for spending the time today speaking. Thanks so much for the great conversation, Dean. Great to see you. Great to see you. Great to see you.